So welcome to a new edition of the Heat Treat Podcast. I'm your host, Carlos Torres. Today we have a great guest, Mr. John Hubbard, legend, uh, all the way from Dallas. Uh, we're super excited to talk about, with John about commercial heat treats, commercial heat treat shops. How are you, John? I'm doing well, Carlos. Buenas tardes y gracias por invitar me a hablar sobre el tratamiento terminico. Tratamiento terminico. All right, John. You you have uh, 100% more Spanish than everybody I have talked to in this podcast. So you, you should be proud. <laughs> so uh, super excited to talk to, to you, John, about commercial heat treat shops, most common mistakes, main KPIs, misconception, pros and cons of uh, being in a, in a, in a family uh, heat treat shop or being in a big uh, corporation, like uh, you were the head of, of, of the biggest one uh, years back. Uh, uh, super interested to know your, your, uh, your thoughts about where the industry is going. So we're gonna talk about that uh, directly with uh, John. So I just would like to uh, go a little bit to, to, uh, to your accomplishment, John. So you, you, you actually sent me uh, a little bit of what you did in the last four years and I must say I'm impressed. So you are a licensed metallurgical engineer uh, and as soon as you finish, uh, you got your degree, you went and started your own company, is that right? That's correct. I started a company which designed and built specialty heat treat and forge furnaces in Cleveland, Ohio. So you were born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio? I was born and raised in Ohio in the southeastern part. Okay. And then from starting that company to build a group of commercial heat treats, what was in the middle? A lot of hard work. <laughs> a lot of hard work. So <laughs> how do you got involved with, with, with the industry? As soon as you left the school, you decided that I want to build furnaces. I want to be, uh, uh, you know, have you ever, uh, were you ever in a heat treat shop before that? I worked my way through college in the heat treat shop at a, a machine tool manufacturer called Warner and Swayze. And uh, I worked at night and went to school during the day. And uh, uh, I originally started you. But uh, by working in the uh, manufacturing plant, I got to know two metallurgical engineers, Wayne Samuelson and Glenn Ratliff, uh, who uh, were my mentors when I was working as a machine tool operator at night. And uh, through them, I changed my major into metallurgical engineering and transferred into the heat treat department where I had a chance to get a lot of practical application while my mentors would uh, teach me all the finer technical points as well as the university education I got. So uh, you were working on a heat treat shop uh, during the time at university, then you finished your degree, you started your own business, and, and then uh, I, uh, in, at Cleveland, Ohio, right? So. Did you start a commercial heat treat in Cleveland, Ohio, or did you move? No, no, what, I, what was I, your decision? Okay, I, uh, I sold my interest in the uh, furnace company. Okay. And, uh, and I joined a commercial heat treat manufacturing company in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma called Hinderleiter Industries. And uh, that's where I, I got from captive heat treating at uh, Warner and Swayze into commercial heat treating with uh, Hinderleiter. And uh, I, I started growing their business. When I joined them, they had one location in Tulsa uh, doing about a million dollars a year. And I grew it uh, to where we uh, had eight locations and uh, through some, uh, some very fortuitous events, I ended up getting the opportunity to buy the uh, heat treat division away from the parent company. And that's how I ended up with my own company. How old were you when you bought the company? I'm guessing I was probably 38. 38, and you, you have bought already eight uh, commercial heat suites? Yeah. Okay, and which process would they had? Uh, mainly carburizing, normalizing? Everything from your typical carburizing, hardening, uh, stress relieving, vacuum, vacuum carburizing in the old CI Hayes furnaces. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, they, they spanned from uh, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, into Texas, out to California, uh, Tennessee, 
and up into uh, Ontario, Canada. So one to eight companies, to eight, eight location, it's, it's, it's exponential growth, right? So you just mentioned that when you, you started working for this company, you had one location. Am, am I right? Correct. So if you could tell those, and I believe we're talking about 1980 something, right? In the 80s. Correct. Is this a correct? Okay. How, how did you, you know, grew and actually manage those companies? Because we're talking about pre, pre-internet, pre-cell phones, right? Uh, so now, you know, communication, quality systems, uh, no emails. How, how did you grow from one location to eight location and how much time it took you? Well, in, in doing it, uh, Carlos, basically my management philosophy was that I uh, hired really good people and uh, would work with them to establish business plans and goals. And they would be the ones that actually ran each individual location. So it was a uh, rather uh, autonomous way of, of managing the business. Uh, on top of that, Uh, one of the things that I did was, uh, along with my team, we developed the very first computer system ever used to manage a heat treat, which we called HOTS, for Hots. Hinderleiter on-time service. And that system was in each of the plants. And it allowed us, from the time the job arrived, to uh, build the router that was going to be ran. And once we got the uh, router established, that was frozen until there was some reason it had to be unfrozen. So every time you got that job, you ran it exactly the same way. We tracked the work through each step of the manufacturing or heat treating process so that when the customer called, we were able to tell them exactly where their parts were and when we could have them ready for them to either pick up or deliver. And uh, so it was a very cost effective way to manage the company. That all tied into our metric system for managing the business, and it tied into our can accounting system. So, how many years did it took you to grow from one one location to eight? Oh, probably. I'm going to say about uh, eight to ten years. Eight to ten years. So, what, what, one heat treat shop a, a year? Just about. Just about. Okay, and you know, I can't, because we're going to talk about KPIs today, right? But uh, KPIs is something like in, from the near uh, I am running eight plants without internet, without Zoom, without everybody uh, texting each other and seeing Excel spreadsheets. How was, uh, how was a, a business management uh, back then? Can, can you share that uh, for, for the younger audience that is actually listening, that, that, they, that the millennials that that uh, they, they were born and raised with internet. How, how was business run that, uh, at that time? Well, they were ran at that time, just like they are today, in, in my opinion. We have better tools today than we had back then, obviously. But uh, back then it was, as, as I said, you, you set up annual business plans. You set up uh, key objectives to achieve during the year. You had the, we didn't call them that, but we had key performance indicators so that we were able to manage the, the key things that drive the performance of the, of the business as it relates to the customer and to the financial performance of the business. So it's really no different than, than it is today as far as the planning and execution process. It's just that we currently have systems now such as the internet and texts and, and uh, so forth, emails, so that it's so much easier than it used to be. Um, it, it, and my style was very much that of having an autonomous way of managing. We would sit down, I would sit down with each of the managers and reach an agreement on what was going to happen over the year. And then uh, I would visit with them once a month, typically. And uh, we would go over how we're progressing on what we were supposed to be doing, how the metrics were doing. Uh, I'd get a chance to touch base with the employees and I would get a chance to go out and visit key customers so that I could uh, see how they felt we were doing. Mm -hmm. so, no, no, so you were a true believer on investing on technology, right? You just told me that you had the first computer uh, system uh, placed on a heat shop. Uh, is that accurate to say? That is correct. So, so 
if if I had like a learn lesson here is like uh, investing on technology and believe it, you know, going thinking out of the box and doing something, uh, you know, innovative was like a big uh, success for you on your company. I, I'll say it it was. You've got to marry the technology though with the people. You got to marry technology with the people. I love that. You know, I, it, it, this is. Uh, Great, uh, you know, uh, great advice. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it because there's, there's a lot of people which is reluctant to accept technology. Whenever you're trying, like, to, and as the head of an organization, whenever you talk about implementing like a new platform or a new software, you always see the eyes rolling of, of the staff that is reluctant to actually accept it. But it, it's, it's very important to keep just growing. You know, implementation of new technologies. Someone will fail. Someone they will be successful. But if you don't implement a thing. For sure, you're going to go down. I don't know what's your opinion on that. Well, the the only constant in life is change. We are constantly changing both ourselves and our jobs, and and that's important to be able to embrace change and and move whatever you're doing forward in a positive way. Fantastic to say. You wouldn't say it better. Uh, now, eight from eight key treats. After comes the uh, Bodhi Codera, right? What what happened there? Well, I was approached by Body Coat. Uh, they wanted they were a UK company that had originally been in textiles, and uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt you there. Correct me if I'm wrong. Body Coat, the Heatred company, comes from body and a coat. Am I right? No, you're not. Uh, body coat I, comes from Mr. Body Coat. Mr. Body Coat, okay, because I I, I knew something was uh, was referred to textiles, but that, that that's the that's the word out there that the urban legend that body coat was a textile and they used to make coats. No, it, so that if that's you, not if correct. You look, Sorry, if, if you if you look at the uh, spelling of coat, it's C O T E. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, no, it, it was Mr. Body Coat who was originally in a textile business, and. Uh, uh, they realized that they were losing the ability to compete in the textile business. And, and this is long after Mr. Body Coat had died, a fellow by the name of Joe, Joe Dweck. And uh, he met a gentleman uh, who had a small heat treat by the name of John Chesworth. John had three other partners and uh, two of the partners who were brothers wanted to get out of the business. And John and uh, his other partner couldn't afford to buy him out. So Joe bought the heat treat, which is completely different from the textile business, mm -hmm. uh, just basically as an investment. And over the ensuing years, what happened was Body Coat sold their uh, investments in the textile industry, took that money and invested it in buying other heat treats, mostly in the UK, a couple of them in uh, mainland Europe. And uh, that's kind of when I came on the scene was um, they were a UK centric publicly traded company that was almost finished transitioning from the textile industry into the heat treat industry. And they wanted to enter the North American market. Um, I, I was the, uh, I believe the third choice on who they uh, approached to buy. Uh, I believe the first was Lindbergh, who said no. The second one was Paolo, who said no. And then they came to me. And uh, given that uh, I didn't have any family members in the business that were interested in uh, taking over the business, and I had always used an outside board of directors, um, I took their proposal to my board of directors and talked about it. And of course I owned the company, so it was my decision. But the reason I had a board of directors was to get the wisdom of other people. And uh, we talked through the pros and cons as we're going to do later about being a, a small private business versus being a larger public business. Uh, I decided that uh, it would be wise for me to, uh, take and uh, sell my company at that time, even though it was earlier than I was personally ready so, so to wait, do. So which year was this? 
Uh, I was in my 50s, so I'm in my early 50s. Okay. And uh, so I, I, uh, I sold uh, my company, Hinderleiter, to Body Coat and became uh, uh, the president of Body Coat North America. We grew by acquisition. Again, Body Coat had a large amount of cash from having liquidated their uh, textile business. And so we started buying companies. And as uh, luck would have it, um, Lindbergh, who was the largest in North America, um, became available. And uh, we ended up buying Lindbergh. And in, in a uh, matter of overnight, we went from having, uh, we had grown it from probably my eight plants up to probably, I don't know, 18 plants. Uh, and, and then all of a sudden we had on top of that another 45 or so plants added. So that became a uh, real interesting transition. The, uh, the, the guppy swallowed the whale. So, so it, it's amazing for me to believe that Borico didn't uh, own a facility, let's say 30 years ago, is that accurate? Uh, their first in the facility States. would have would have probably been uh, in in the uh, 80s. In the, the, their first street facility of body code was uh, acquired in the 80s, right? And that, and that, that it, would that would be my guess. Yes. And and, and they uh, they you sold your company 10 years after that. In the uh, 90s. Yes, pr approximately. Yes. Okay. So body code started in North America in the 1990s. And your uh, heat treat group was the first, uh, well, became body code uh, USA, if you want to call it like that, right? Correct, yes. And in, in, in the 1990s, and then Lindbergh, for the guys that don't know Lindbergh, I remember Lindbergh when I was a, a very little a child, right? Uh, they yes. were like the, 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 the big, one of the biggest players. I don't know if the biggest at that time, but they have, they, they, you know, they, they were a big player and they used to purchase a lot of stuff, a lot of furnaces. And body code acquired that, and by by doing that, uh, it became the largest uh, commercial heat treat uh, company in the states when Limber was acquired. Absolutely, yes. Okay. And, and by the way, don't confuse Lindbergh Furnace Company with Lindbergh Heat Treat. Oh, totally, they, totally, totally. They they were two completely separate companies. There, there's a Lindbergh. Uh, that actually manufactures furnaces and there used to be one limber company that uh, was a heat rich shop. Correct. Okay, so uh, in, in the meantime, you were uh, president of Bodico North America. You were working on that. Was Bodico growing at the same level in Europe or in Asia at that time? Uh, not in Asia, but in, in Europe. Um, right after uh, I bought Lindbergh, uh, Body Coat uh, acquired a group out of France that uh, dominated the French market, and they bought a group in Sweden that dominated the Nordic countries. And so, yes, they, they were growing in Europe after, after we had grown North America. And, and why the decision uh, to buy companies uh, instead of uh, founding them? If, if they had the capital, you know, why, why does Body Coat uh, decides to, well, sometimes they buy a company, some, sometimes they found a company. What, what's like the, the decision driven? Okay, Carlos, you've done it yourself. You've started companies. It's painful. It is. It's, uh, it, it is major negative cash flow. And uh, in, in today's world, it's gotten even harder getting approvals from various municipalities to put in mm -hmm. a, a heat treat. Mm -hmm. It's become difficult from an environmental standpoint. It's become difficult from an approval for things. You mentioned NADCAP earlier. Uh, getting approvals is a time consuming business. So if you can buy a company that is already going and already has cash flow, then that's a positive compared to doing a greenfield. And Body Coat rarely does greenfields. They've announced two greenfields this year. Uh, one of them is outside of Chicago, which really is a replacement for what was Lindbergh's flagship plant in Melrose Park. It was a huge, huge factory 
that uh, over the, the decades has shrunk. And so they needed to right size it. So they built a new plant in Aurora. The other new plant they just announced, I think last week was in Syracuse, Syracuse. New York. That's because the old plant burned down and mm -hmm. they needed a new plant. So very seldom does body coat build a brand new plant. They, we, we have, or they have done it, but the, the preference is to buy a company. Now I told you the pros of it, there's cons to it too. The cons are that when you, when you buy an existing heat treat, you uh, inherit their equipment and facilities, which typically have been put together uh, haphazardly. Not in all cases, but typically heat treaters uh, start out and they buy a furnace and, and it's used and they rebuild it and they set it in the corner and don't think about what's gonna happen 10 years from now. And 10 years from now, they've bought five more furnaces and shoehorned it in and nothing has a flow to it. Uh, none of them have been put in with maybe the same control systems or combustion systems or anything else. And so you, you, when you buy an existing heat treat, you buy whatever is there from an infrastructure standpoint, which is usually not anywhere near optimal. The other thing is you're buying a culture and culture is extremely important to the success of a business. And in, in a privately owned company, you have a very different approach to culture from that of a um, publicly traded company. Uh, when you've got a bunch of, uh, of companies, you have to have uniformity as best you can. And in some case, legally, you're forced to have uniformity between plants. Um, anywhere from uh, work rules to payroll rules, to safety rules, to environmental systems. Uh, I mean, it, it's all very interwoven and the culture of a company is uh, very important in its success. And let's talk about culture. I, I, I love that you brought this subject up because right now, it, it, like uh, when we talk about other industries like Zappos or Amazon or you name it, they're always talking about uh, the culture like Pixar, right? But in your, in your case, Uh, well, in, in the case of heat treats, there are a bunch of uh, individual companies, let's say uh, from 50 people to let's say 100 at most. I don't know if that's accurate to say, but each location has a different culture because they, it, it, it was driven by their manager, the leader, the president, maybe the owner, right? How do you standardize that culture? Maybe one company was all about customer service and maybe other company just about Uh, uh, maintenance and maybe other company is, is it's it's all about just making profit, right? Uh, how do you standardize in in many locations the same culture when you acquire companies? Okay, it's it's very time consuming to start with, and and uh, remember I said change is the one constant in life, um, and when you're changing culture, you also run the risk of changing people because some people just cannot adapt to a new culture. And, and I have found that one of the key ways to get culture is to get a common vocabulary so that you talk about the same things and you talk about the same metrics so that you're measuring the same things. You talked about whether it's maintenance, that's covered in uh, equipment uptime. Uh, you you uh, talked about uh, turnaround time. That's another metric. Uh, you can talk about uh, energy utilization. Uh, each metric creates a common uh, dialogue between uh, yourself and each plant and between each of the plants among themselves. So that's very critical to have the, the same set of KPIs that are driving the performance of each company and be reporting them the same way. Uh, we're going to talk KPIs in a minute, but I just would like to know, uh, just, just to, 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 to finish uh, the, the, the story of your career. Now, you're managing the United States, uh, uh, Body Code Bites Limburg, uh, around, 20, around 20 heat treats. And How was no, around that, no around around 40 heat treats? Around, okay, okay. So you had eight then 
Then you bought uh, 20 from Limburg, right? No, we no, we bought onesie twosies to get up to about 20 heat treats. Oh, 20, 20, 20 heat treats. So yeah, this is before Lindbergh. Oh, before Lindbergh. Okay. So what how was the jump from you managing the, the United States all the way to uh, becoming CEO of Body Code? <laughs> okay. You find the question. I, 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 no, well, I mean, how many years it took you? Or how was the, yeah, how can I ask you this? You know, managing the United States, it's something, but managing the whole world is a totally different animal, right? Yes, it is. Uh, all, this, all of a sudden, uh, you go from uh, one national culture Yes. Uh, be, saying that we did have uh, a couple of plants in Canada and uh, actually yeah. one in, in Mexico, but but it was one culture, one language. It, it was not, and NAFTA, it's pretty much like this uh, North America, Canada, right. United States, Mexico. Uh, and me being from Mexico, uh, we, we get a lot the American way. You know, we, you, yes. we get a lot of. Uh, uh, you, you know, uh, exposure to it, so we actually understand it, right? But yes. when you talk about Europe, Asia, that's a totally different animal. That's correct, and and so the, the again, it comes back to the same thing, Carlos, is that you have a common language that you're talking about, and that language is your key performance indicators. And so, if you have those, no matter what country you're in, what language you're speaking you are still measuring and talking about the same key performance indicators. So now from one heat reach up to eight to 50, maybe to a hundred, uh, you saw a lot of uh, heat reach shops. Uh, what are the most common mistakes that you, you saw on the heat reach shops? Well, of the ones I'll, I'll leave this to the uh, ones that we acquired or the ones that we looked at acquiring. Sure. Uh, the, the, the most common mistake that we see is the owner sucking cash out of the business for personal use rather than reinvesting in the business the cash that it needs. Uh, that is a very common mistake. Um, the other common mistake we make or the, that we see is the owner being unwilling to invest in training his people. Uh, he's afraid, why am I going to spend money to train this guy only to have him go to work at my competitor? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I've always been of the attitude that I would rather train somebody and have them skilled and then have them leave than have somebody unskilled working with me that I can't trust their quality or their safety. The, the other thing that I find it's an, a, a problem is the inconsistent treatment of people. Um, owners of private businesses tend to have employees that they like, and they will treat them different than employees who they may not like. Uh, some of my best people that I worked with were a huge pain in my butt because they were very strong they were very opinionated and nothing that you said to them ever went unchallenged. Those are the type of people that I like because they're thinking, they're looking at different ideas. But in a private business, um, people who have independent thoughts are typically beat down rather than encouraged. Um, the other thing which I, I talked about earlier is in private businesses, you almost always find that corners have been cut. Things are not done the way they should be done. I don't care whether it's the instrumentation or the quality system or safety uh, or environmental compliance. I, I believe safety is a big course. deal. I believe safety is a big deal in that, in that area because uh, uh, sometimes safety upgrades are very expensive time-wise and uh, the guys just want to quench stuff and and um, and uh, charge for it. Yes. Yeah. Well, some some of the saddest times of my career have been because of safety violations that have ended in either serious injury or death, and uh, they were all avoidable. Uh, 
and it was almost always because someone had not followed proper procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that I find it's a common mistake uh, in, in private companies is there's no strategy. There's no annual or monthly business plan and little or no use of metrics. Um, another thing that I run into, and, and you may have, have ran into this too, is that almost every heat treat that I've ever talked to will tell me that they are the best in the industry. We have a reputation for being the best. So they tend to believe their own BS rather than benchmarking and hearing what uh, their customers have to say or uh, maybe what competitors are doing. The Metal Treating Institute is a great organization for benchmarking, but if you look at it, very few of the heat treats that are members actually participate in their benchmarking because mm -hmm. they don't really wanna know how they stand compared to other people because they really believe they're better. And, and if you, and if, I believe if someone thinks they're the best, uh, they don't travel much. That's right. Because That's uh, exactly uh, right. If, if you might be the best at something, right? But you want to be the best at everything. And there's going to be a guy that, that does uh, things differently in the process or something. Uh, and, you know, I, I go to a lot of big companies, big, uh, and, and I'm talking OEMs, like assembly plants. And they believe they're the best at it. And that they are the guys that they only do, know how to do it. And this process, and you know, they're competitors and they do the exact thing. They have a different, uh, you know, twist under the other process, but uh, they have their own culture, their own way. So if, if someone thinks they're the best at something, first, I believe they should be a little more humble and they should travel a little more. Right now, I agree with a, that. A, a little is hard, right? No, yeah. Do not, no, do I, not fall I, on the comfort zone. Yes. I, I would like to bring up one uh, other what I will refer to as a potentially fatal flaw of uh, privately held businesses is that they bring their kids into the business without the kids becoming more valuable to the business than the business is to the kids. Now, in meeting you and seeing that you're coming into your father's business, and I can tell you have a passion for what you do. You aren't doing this because you can make a good paycheck but a lot of second generation or third generation kids, what this is, is an easy buck for them, but I can feel your passion, Carlos. And so you're not gonna fall into that trap. Yeah, well, it's, uh, there's uh, most of the of, of heat rich shops, I don't know the exact data, maybe you can help a little bit. Do, do we know how many are uh, private or how many are family owned uh, or, uh, or, or big groups? Do we know that? Is, is yeah, that like it's, an MTI? It, 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 it's uh, more like 85% of, uh, uh, and I'm talking in, in uh, North America, 85%, uh, about 85% are privately held. It's family owned? Correct. Okay. 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 And yeah, w being a, a second, third or fourth generation, maybe sometimes uh, it, the, 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 son or the grandkid doesn't have the passion for it. And we talk about this with Jimmy Oaks. Uh, our industry is very passionate. It's very interesting. We, we basically do rocket science, but now there's a struggle for talent. We're fighting for talent because everybody wants to work on a, a, a fancy startup or uh, work on Facebook or Amazon or, or uh, be, being a, an entrepreneur. And I believe our industry is very passionate. It's very interesting, but we have as a community to do a better job uh, to to market it and and uh, and and invite the younger engineers to work on our industry as, as problem solvers because they they see a bunch of old furnaces with flames with oil on the on, on on the pit so it's not a very sexy industry until you get to know it I don't know if if, if you have an opinion on that how can we attract younger talent to this industry John Well I think the the key way to do it is through apprenticeships and to, mm -hmm. and to uh, reach out to uh, high schools to bring them in on field trips and, and explain to them what we do, show them how the product that we heat treat ends up in very important applications. Anything from uh, automotive transmissions to uh, aircraft to medical devices. Um, I mean, 
get them to see that you may be looking at a chunk of metal, but that chunk of metal goes into this component that goes into that device, which does this great thing in the world. And, and so I think reaching out to them at a impressionable age, uh, what's happened is that um, things such as being a, a computer app developer or being a lawyer or being an accountant has become very glamorous um, so that people are attracted to those. They don't know anything about heat treat. Uh, my father was a tool and die maker and I knew nothing about heat treat until I went off to college. And so if, if we can reach out to young people, if we can offer apprenticeships to them, uh, then I think we can attract more people into it to make a career. Because once you get into it, you find out that every day is different. There's no two days alike. And they're always very challenging intellectually. Yeah, because right now the, the the like the main decision is if I want to work on a family-owned company or I want to go and and try to do uh, my professional career in a big big corporation. But talking about that, what are the pros and cons of uh, of being on a big corporate heat treat and on a family-owned? Because how I see it, when you're in a big corporate group, you lose a lot of speed because there's a lot of bureaucracy, paperwork, things that you know, process, but the process gets slower. And a lot of the advantage of being a, a family owned company is like the customer is talking to the main guy, to the decision maker, to the president, to the owner who actually can make the shots. Otherwise you have to call your boss and ask for permission. Uh, what would you say are like the biggest pros and, uh, pros and cons of a big corporation uh, against uh, a, a family owned business? Well, I've, I've been on both sides in uh, my own private company and uh, in a publicly traded company. And so I have great insight into it and experience. Uh, the pro of corporate ownership is you have access to capital for growth. I told you the body coat was able to grow because they had access to capital by liquidating the textile side of the business. Uh, that's, a, that's a major plus in our industry because heat treating is so capital intense. Uh, the other is in a, in a uh, large group, you have professional operating systems, uh, which uh, give you the discipline that may or may not be there in a private company. Uh, you've got development and growth opportunities for your employees, which tends to get them to stick around and, and learn and grow because you've got multiple locations and they can go from, from being a furnace operator to being a general manager at some point in their career. I think that's very valuable. I think, yes, I, I think that's very valuable. That's, that's one of the challenges of a private company that I'll get into later. Um, the other thing about a professional business is that, or a larger business, is you have professional support. You have accountants, you have HR people, you have metallurgists, you have uh, mechanical engineers, you have facilities engineers. And the other pro is that it's very performance driven. Uh, you, you don't ever take your foot off the accelerator. You're always driving forward. Now, you mentioned one of the big cons of being in a large corporation is that you've got overhead. You've got people above you. Uh, they wanna know why, what do, you, what do you need this money for? And uh, you have semi-rigid systems. Uh, it takes time to get an approval for a capital investment. So it is a slower moving organization. Uh, and you also have someone besides yourself looking over your shoulder. So if, if you make a bad decision, it doesn't get swept under the carpet because nobody wants to tell you you have no clothes on. Uh, it gets talked about and you have to uh, make sure you don't make too many bad decisions or you're not gonna have a job. So that's one of the cons of a corporate ownership. The pro of family ownership you've already had. You get ready in the morning, you're looking in the mirror and you say, today I'm gonna buy that furnace or today I'm gonna start a new plant. You make the decision when you decide to make the decision. Yes, I, I, I'm gonna uh, stop you there because you mentioned in the beginning of the interview that you used to have a board of directors. 
and yes. you were the owner of the company. Uh, Correct. Would, would you encourage, uh, uh, you know, uh, small, small, well, small to mid-sized companies to start their own board of uh, advisors? You know, not not with a boat, right? But to get people that actually know, uh, you know, about accounting, or maybe that they know about uh, some other industry, another uh, businessman, and and say and just share with you, share with them. I want, I would like to buy a foreigners. Uh, I would like to uh, hire a sales director and 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 just uh, uh, throw that idea around. Would you encourage them to do so? Because when you own a company, you can do whatever you want with it, but it, it's not like you're always right. But if you bounce the ideas with some other experts that doesn't that don't have an interest in the company, I believe that's, uh, that's pretty valuable. I agree 100%. That's why I had an outside board of directors. Uh, they, well, they didn't they, get paid any. They, they didn't get paid anything. They uh, they got a meal, and they got to travel to uh, Dallas. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, we would have regular phone calls, but they didn't get any kind of a salary. And I, uh, but, they, people... but they, they, they didn't have a boat. Uh, did they have to boat or were you, they yes. just were uh, oh, advisors? Yes. Oh, oh yeah. they yeah. had a boat. Yeah, of course they did. But, but then again, remember it's a privately held company. Therefore, if, if they really get you upset, you vote them off the board because you had control of, of totally on the board. Well, but, I never, but least... I never. I did that because my advisors were always very business oriented and they mm -hmm. understood that it was my company and they were there to give me their best advice and experience. Uh, so I urge people to bring an outside board of directors in, people who bring skills that you may or may not have. Uh, for instance, I, I had um, a, a fellow who was in the investment banking business. Um, I had a fellow who was uh, uh, very uh, much into the uh, uh, investment side of things. I had a fellow who was a furnace manufacturer. Uh, by the way, never bought one of his furnaces while he was on the board, but he understood the heat treating industry from a completely different perspective. And so I, I had those three non-executive directors that were my counselors throughout the process of, of running my own company and is very valuable. Now, I talked about the pros of a family business. The con is you may decide you want to buy a furnace, but you may not have the money. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have the uh, huge availability of capital like a larger company does. The other thing is, you know, that's why you have an outside board. You've got one point of view. And if you think that your employees are going to be completely honest with you, you're fooling yourself. They know who signs the paycheck and they will fish to find out what answer you want. And so you don't really get an independent, um, very, very good input from your own employees. The other two big cons as I see it one of them is that typically the owner of a private business, that business is their personal wealth. Mm -hmm. And so they, they have their concentration of wealth as opposed to whenever, you know, I had my eight companies, I had eight plants. So if one of them caught fire and burned down, I had seven more. And so if somebody had got a single location uh, or even uh, several locations, their wealth is tied up and concentrated. The other thing is, what are you going to do when you want to retire? Uh, recently on the Monte, uh, they announced that Robert Wooler in Philadelphia was closing its doors. They're closing its doors because Biff Kaidel had nobody behind him to take over the business. And coming back to the other fault that I've seen, he had not invested in his facility. But what he had was he had major aerospace approvals that were worthwhile, but he couldn't let go of the business. So it's gone. So what do you do when you want to retire? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how many how, how many heat shops have you been involved in buying? 
uh, 50, 100, it's just, it's just a, a number. How many I've bought? Yeah, well, with body code, uh, do, do you do you target no. right now with the thermal process yeah. are, are about 100? In, 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 in my career, I've bought about 200 companies. 200 companies, okay. Yes. On, on, on these purchases, what's the most valuable asset of a heat treat? Well, let's see. The, I mean, we, we, when you enter to, is, is it the building, the furnaces, the team, the, the customer contract that they have, the, uh, what, what's like the main thing? Okay, well, how do we value a heat treat? That's how I'll answer the question, okay? Okay, got it. Is, is that a fair answer? That's a fair answer. When, when someone's in this, it's a very personal experience. Every seller is going to have emotions. And I say that as having been through it personally when I sold Hinderleiter. They have expectations, whether they're founded on solid business principles or what I call country club gossip. You hear that somebody sold their business for $5, or $5 million dollars and therefore my business is worth at least $5 million. It's gotta be founded in something realistic. Uh, every business is going to be sold or closed at some time in history. And when professionals value their business, they look at multiple things. And I consider myself a professional having bought you know, around 200 businesses in my career. You look at their historic performance trends, and, and that's probably the top line that you look at. So if, if someone approaches me that they want to sell their business, the first thing I ask for is give me your last five year sales and EBITDA earnings before interest, depreciation, and tax, okay? Uh, that tells me right away, am I interested in them from a financial standpoint? If I am, then it goes into looking at their organization. The owner typically is selling when he's ready to exit, either because he's burned out or he's got a uh, illness. I refer to that as when they've seen God. And uh, uh, at some point, uh, you look at the people who are going to remain behind. What's the team that he's built? And remember, one of the weaknesses of private businesses is they don't build a team. They are mm -hmm. the team. They're the glue that holds the thing together. Uh, look at the equipment condition. And again, most privately held businesses, the equipment is in functional condition. Um, you look at the land and building. Is it adequate for current use? And does it have expansion potential? Because I never buy a business without expecting to grow it. So that's another thing. Then you look at their approvals. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, Wooler Company has uh, great approvals for aerospace. I mean, great approvals. Um, you look at the market segments they serve. Uh, are they in automotive? Are they in oil and gas? Are they in aerospace, medic, whatever? What market segments and how does their sales break out into those different segments? And then you look at customer concentration. If they have uh, one or two major customers that make up the majority of their business, that's a real concern. I never want to buy a business that has, say, more than 20% maximum with any one customer. Um, do they have system, systems that they use to operate their business? Uh, operational metrics, accounting, you know, how do they run their business and what's the competitive landscape? Uh, you, you need to understand how they fit in the market. So those are all the things you take into consideration. In the end, what you do is you're going to apply a multiple times a normalized EBITDA. Normalized EBITDA means that you have to add back to the reported EBITDA, any anomalies that exist in the private ownership. For instance, do they have a private plane? Uh, do they have a horse ranch? Uh, do they have a vote? Do they have a vacation house? Do they have a mistress? And yes, I've seen every one of those <laughs> in acquisitions that, that is on the company books as an operating expense. So you've got to add those back in because they're gonna go away whenever whenever the uh, uh, business is sold. But then the other thing you have to do is typically the owner wants to add back his remuneration, but you also have to factor in cost 
of a professional manager who's going to run that, whether they currently exist in the business or whether you got to uh, bring one in from one of your other companies. The multiple that you pick from all those items I outlined above is then applied to the normalized EBITDA to quantitatively determine what you're willing to pay for the business. Now that multiple in our industry is in the four to six and a half times normalized EBITDA. There depending are a few if, companies. Uh, I mean, and that's depending if, if on uh, just, just say on their industry, but there can be heat treaters on aerospace or maybe on oil and gas, uh, the automotive constructions. Those are different industries. So which, which is like the, the hottest market which will give you the biggest EBITDA right now? Okay. You can't do just that. That's part of the things I ticked off. The uh, people that remain, the equipment, the building, the mm -hmm. approvals, the market segments, the customer concentration, the systems used, the competitive landscapes, those all go in. And what happens is the buyer... Uh, which, which in my case would be myself along with mm -hmm. my team would sit down and we would talk about each of these items and we would land on a multiple. So if, if they are in the uh, automotive industry mm -hmm. today, that's a negative. But if they have a particular market niche, uh, such as doing FNC on brake pads, then that's a market that's not going to go with go away with electrification. So that's a positive, whereas they're in the automotive market, which is a negative, but the segment that they're in is a positive. Um, you know, so all those things are taken in, into consideration to come up with that multiple. And it is not a quantitative, it's a qualitative analysis that's debated among the team. Thanks for sharing that. And let me ask you a question. What will be the top KPIs uh, every commercial heat treater should have to measure plans? You, you, you were in charge of hundreds of commercial heat treats, which are like the main KPIs that everyone has to put an eye on. Okay, I'm gonna go through the KPIs, which I consider the most important Mm -hmm. And they are not in order of importance, but mm -hmm. uh, each one of them is very important to how to successfully run a commercial heat treater. And uh, uh, to quote my predecessor with a quote that actually got him in trouble, read my lips. These are important. Okay. <laughs> got it. Utilization of each piece of equipment. How many hours a day out of 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is that furnace actually got parts in it and running. That doesn't count time that you're doing preventive maintenance. It doesn't count the time you're doing breakdown maintenance. It doesn't count the time you're doing quality assurance by, by doing uh, uniform surveys or probe checks. It is every hour of the day, which ones have actual work in them that are, are making me money. And it doesn't count rework, by the way. So how, 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 uh, how I measure my utilization is that- It's, it's a percentage. We, it's a percent, but if we have a recipe, if, if the furnace is running a, a process recipe, it's yes. considered utilization. If the furnace is hot, but it's not running a process recipe, it's, co it's considered idle time. Correct. Right. Okay, so I'm doing- I'm doing okay over there by showing my utilization, right? So th th that's, that's how I- That's correct. It. Okay. Yeah. If uh, it doesn't have, if it doesn't, if the furnace does not have uh, paying parts in it, mm -hmm. then it's not being utilized. Okay, the-, and, the uh, and l l Let me just stop you for a second. What, what because it's, when, whenever we use utilization, we tend to compare the, the, these machines with, uh, let's say CNC uh, machine shops. What's a typical, and realistic utilization of performance because you cannot utilize a machine at 100%. What's like the lowest acceptable utilization of this? And we, let's talk about 80, an IQ. 80%. 80 if you're below 80%, you're not utilizing your furnace correctly. Correct. 
Okay. That 80% uh, allows you time to do all the things you need to do for preventive maintenance, for quality checks, uh, for all the different things that you need to do. 80% is our benchmark. If you're below 80%, you need to answer some questions. Or you need to uh, shut down furnaces. That's right. That's correct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing it does, Carlos, is, is it allows you the flexibility for the uh, urgent fall-in customer that has mm -hmm. to have the job run right now. If you're running above 80%, it's very hard to break into your cycles to be able to take care of that important job that just has to be run now. And those are the profitable jobs, right? Because you have already covered your cost with the 80% of utilization. Will that be accurate to say? Uh, well, now you've led to the second KPI. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Which is yield rate. S sorry, uh, I'm, su I'm, I'm super eager about talking about this. So sorry if I yes, interrupt. Yes, well, ahead, as, as, you, as you should be. The, these, these KPIs are really what drive the success of a business. So the, the second one is yield rate. That's how many dollars per hour are you getting out of each load in the furnace? And that means that from the time the load goes into the furnace to the time it comes out of the furnace, that's so many hours. And then you take that load and you divide the dollars that were in that load by the hours and that will tell you how many do dollars per hour. So the break-in load that I just talked about, you said, and that's gonna be the real profitable ones. It may or it may not be. Uh, what you were talking about was incremental pricing. And incremental pricing means I've got nothing to do. And so if I take my direct costs and get anything above my direct costs, that's better than doing nothing. And that's a different pricing concept, which we're not talking about. We're not talking pricing concepts, we're talking KPIs. So utilization and yield rate are two very critical things. The other critical metric that we measure is total people cost as a percentage of sales. Now, total people cost is important because total people cost is more than just the salary you're paying. You've got fringe benefits that you're paying. So you need to add that in on top of it to know exactly what your total people costs are. But total people costs are as a percentage of sales is important. Why is that important? Because people cost is the most expensive thing in a heat treat. Okay. Then the other key metric is turnaround time. And that means from the time the job comes in to the time the job is completely finished and ready to be picked up by the customer. The other uh, metric is EBITDA percent, which I talked about before, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. Uh, that's important just because that's an overall measurement of your profitability. The other things you have in here already, will drive EBITDA up to a nice level. And then the final one, not in matter of importance, but just because it's the last one I'm gonna cover is safety. And that's incidents and severity. Our industry is a very dangerous industry. So it's important that you measure your in incidents and severity and you talk about them. In fact, every meeting I ever held as a CEO with uh, my operations people started with safety. Uh, let's talk about safety. When you, when you talk about safety, you're measuring safety of, of, of the personnel of the, or you're referring to it as liability. Well, I view safety as every employee comes to work mm -hmm. expecting to go home to their family that night. Okay. In one piece. And I believe that it is our responsibility to do everything in our power to make sure that that happens. Mm -hmm. So if we want to attract people into a, our business, they need to understand that those fire belching furnaces with flames everywhere are safe. They are operated safely, they're maintained safely. And even though they have danger with them, we manage that danger. So those are like the main KPIs. Let, let's just repeat it. Uh, let's uh, utilization of each piece of equipment, uh, yield rate per load, it's uh, dollars per hour, 
uh, people cost as a percentage of sales, turnaround time from door to door, EBITDA percentage, and safety. So that will Correct. be like the. So let me look at the camera. You heard it from John Hubbard, right? <laughs> so, so thanks, John. Uh, my next next question to you will be. Uh, why should the manufacturing consider using a commercial heat treat as opposed to investing in their own capacity? Well, what's the pitch there from, from the commercial side to, to the manufacturer? Okay, well, to answer that, it, it's uh, just a second. Um, I want to get my notes here because I, I want to make sure. In a manufacturing business, they have KPIs as well as we do. And so they're looking to control costs to be fast to satisfy their customers' needs. Uh, the primary reason a manufacturer or would or should use a commercial heat treat is opposing to have their own heat treat department besides the high capital cost needed is the cost of not operating 24-7. If you are a manufacturer and do not have enough business to run 24 seven, you have to have a compelling reason to do heat treating yourself. Either it's turnaround time or it's quality. It is a, a definite lodestone around your neck from a cost standpoint if you do not run 24 seven. If you do have enough work to run 24 seven, it is in my opinion important that you have no more capacity than what you need to run about 80% of your own work. The reason for that is you're gonna have breakdowns, you're gonna have peak demands, and you may even have a fire or a catastrophic event. And if you don't have a commercial heat treater who is knowledgeable on how to run your parts, that you're comfortable with how they run your parts, then you are going to be in a, a real problem situation. So it is always good to have a commercial heat treater on your side. And, and to me, the key reason to use a commercial is number one, if you don't have enough work, and number two is a safety valve so that you don't get caught with not being able to satisfy your own manufacturing needs. So how many times you pitched this to uh, uh, to manufacturers while you were in body code? Hundreds of times, right? Hundreds of times, and and I can tell you that it comes down to the person on the other side of the desk's uh, philosophy. There are people who want to control everything that goes on. Mm -hmm. They believe that they can do it better from a quality standpoint. They believe they can do it cheaper from a cost standpoint, and they can do it faster from a turnaround standpoint. And uh, I have uh, won that argument and I have lost that argument. So it all depends on the person on the other side of the desk and what they believe is important. Now let's talk about customers. Uh, customers for a commercial heat shop. shop. Uh, you know, everybody knows that automotive uh, customers are very pushy. You know, what's your opinion on pushing back on customers? How how aggressive should you push back? Because they're very pushy, right? So do you have to deal with a lot of these guys? And how do you actually react to customers which uh, were uh, very demanding? Well, at Body Coat, uh, I got involved in, uh, and I won't name the customers, uh, the top two body coat customers globally uh, would have a, a, uh, a command performance by me. Uh, they would send me an invite to come visit with them. And it was always a very difficult discussion. Uh, and I will start by saying the old saw about customers. The customer is always right. is to decide if the pain worth the pleasure. 
if what the customer is specifying or demanding is too much pain, then help them find an alternative supplier. The most demanding customers I ever worked with helped us to become a better company. That's when they were pushing back on quality or delivery. Uh, being able to fire a customer is one of the advantages of a heat treat that has not allowed themselves to become overly dependent on one customer. I consider 20% to be the maximum level of dependence on any one customer, but it, it is a uh, difficult situation when the customer is difficult and unreasonable, and you've got to decide when the pleasure is not worth the pain. So you're saying if, if a customer is less than 20% and you don't, are not very dependent on two or three customers, let's say, you have the privilege of firing a customer because it, it won't affect you as much. You or, have the ability. You when, have the, whenever, well, you when, actually have the ability to go back and charge more and say, well, if this is your level of demands, in order to keep up with the quality you're requesting and the customer service uh, level, That, uh, that you want, uh, this price has to change, right? So you, you, it puts you in the position to negotiate. Is, is that what Ex you're saying? Exactly. And, and, and by the way, it is rare that we ever walk away from a customer uh, without trying to negotiate more pleasure for more pain. Mm -hmm. and, and what's the benchmark? Are all of the comp... Because having... having Everybody wants to have many customers that are not like the main guy. Uh, you know, what is the benchmark on every heat treat shop? Uh, they have five, 10, 20 customers. They, because I know that there's a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, commercial shops that they run on a program or a customer, right? They, they might have uh, one customer, which is 50% of their business because What you're saying is like the perfect scenario for every business owner, but what's like the benchmark on the industry? If a customer is going to be more than 20%, then uh, I would require a long-term contract. Mm -hmm. But th 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 that, that, and, and the long-term contract, by the but, way. But, but it, let, it, me, let, let me refer my question. Uh, what, what, on heat rich shops, the ones that you've seen, you have purchased, you have visited. What's like the benchmarking on, on, on customer split of the pie? Is, is, is the higher end depending on one customer or there's, there are a bunch of them which they have a very healthy uh, pie split? What, what have you seen? Well, the, the lion's share of businesses which I've ever bought have been very diversified in their customer number and base. And as I said, I can only think of a couple of cases where I bought a company that had greater concentration than 20% with any one customer. And when I did, that customer who was larger had a long-term agreement in mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. So if you had a very dependent customer, you should make sure you have a long-term agreement. That, that's that's correct. Your, So it's neither bad or good because if there's the business out there, but you're going to depend so much on a customer, just, just get a long-term agreement. That's right. Okay. And by the way, when you say just get a long-term agreement, getting a long-term agreement is uh, very painful to do. But if you stand by your guns and you are truly important to that customer and they are that important to you, then it's worth the battle. Mm -hmm. Now, We, we have seen a substantial change on processes, uh, in, you know, uh, vacuum. I actually, I actually read something about that you predicted back in 2001 uh, that, you know, that uh, there wouldn't be any more batch IQs by 2001. And that didn't happen. Vacuum had their like, uh, was like the trending thing. And now, <laughs> now uh, you know, uh, German technology, uh, French technology, European, super expensive, super fancy equipment. They, they look like Teslas, but they're not cheap, right? But right. now, you know, FNC, gas nitriding, uh, we called it a hip uh, additive manufacturing. Uh, now they're, they're even, uh, they want to, uh, 
they, they want to remove endo. There's a couple of OEMs removing endo from the chamber and using kind of a vacuum uh, hybrid system. What's next? I mean, and, and, and let me let me tell you why I, I believe about this, because the, the, I don't believe heat treating is is uh, changing its technology as, as other industrial processes. It's, it's very slow because furnaces have a, a, a very long lifetime. But what can you tell us about the uh, future of heat treat? Well, Carlos, I actually made my prediction in about 1985. And I predicted that by 2001, we would not see batch IQs with oil quench anymore, that furnaces would be vacuum with gas quench. And I based that on the fact that it made for a cleaner, safer, cooler workplace that would be able to attract employees easier because even back then we had trouble attracting employees. And so I thought, that uh, vacuum would solve all those problems. But in reality, I was naive. It didn't happen. In fact, I, I uh, um, found that what happens is cost is the big driver of market demand. And even today, batch IQs with oil quench are outselling vacuum uh, with, with gas quench. And it comes down to dollars and cents. Uh, if your product requires the high level of, of metallurgical properties and you're willing to pay for it, then you're going to end up with uh, LPC. Uh, but not many people need that. And so it, it is a niche market and only certain applications can justify it. Uh, I don't see, or you're, you're right about the fancy equipment that's out there. But the fancy part of it is mostly in the control side of the business. Uh, the, the basic machine is still pretty much the same as it was. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the controls that, that are in place, electronic and atmospheric controls. Um, so we're not a fast changing industry, which I think is fortunate in some ways. Uh, you mentioned HIP. HIP has been very concentrated at body coat uh, literally up until last year. Um, and, and body coat still controls the HIP market uh, worldwide, actually. Uh, but in the past year, there have been other uh, companies entering that market. And amazingly, some of them have been heat treats. Uh, Apollo, uh, Flame, uh, Accurate, which is part of uh, uh, Albert's out of the Netherlands, uh, Kitty Hawk, and even uh, Heat Treat Mexico have put in hip capacity. Uh, several of those companies were specifically enticed to enter the market by some of Body Coat's key customers who were not happy with it, what they were getting, perhaps a consequence of what we talked about pushing back against troublesome customers. Um, but you need to be aware that HIP is a hugely capital intensive business and it is potentially dangerous. Uh, Body is. Coat, when I was there, had a plant in Andover, Massachusetts explode and destroy a 110,000 square foot plant. Uh, fortunately, nobody was uh, seriously injured. Uh, it happened uh, on a night shift weekend and so there were only two people in the plant. And uh, it was amazing if you saw the pictures of what was left after the explosion. Uh, additive manufacturing is ramping up. I don't know where it's going to go. I think that it's a niche market. And I think that it will be driven by cost, just like I said, the batch IQ versus mm -hmm. vacuum. Uh, I, I really can't tell you, but I can tell you that additive manufacturing is going to require heat treating and it's going to retire in some cases hip application. Uh, in my opinion, the most successful and profitable heat treats that I've seen in my career with few exceptions have been ones that have specialized in no more than say three different processes in their plant. Uh, they become specialists and they know what they're doing. 
if they try and be jacks of all trade, they are masters of none. So I'm an advocate in heat treats having no more than three processes that they really offer. Thanks, John. So this is John uh, predicting for the next 20 years. Uh, hopefully you're right this time. And, I probably uh, won't be able around, be around it, to find out. <laughs> it, 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 uh, things are going to evolve. Uh, now, I, I always like this, uh, uh, this section of the show. Uh, hacks and gadgets. John, is there any heat treat hack or gadget that you know that has helped you in your career that you would like to share with the audience? Well, to me, uh, a hack or a gadget is something that's kind of a sleight of hand. Uh, and heat treating is a basic service industry. There's no easy solution that I know of. It's hard, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that's when you're doing it right. Uh, in my opinion, the, the disciplined use of a well-designed computer system that assures that you're tracking your work, that you have fixed parameters so you can do a repeat quality job each time, and systematically collect the information so you can actually measure and report accurately your, your metrics uh, and deliver the parts on time. Those are all basic things, but if you have a computer system that provides you all those things at the touch of a button, that's the best hack that I know of. Uh, so that's the only hack I know of, Carlos. It's, it's a gadget, you know, computers are gadgets, so it invests on uh, computer systems, ERPs, scanners. That's, uh, that's right. You know, because you can have, uh, because I, I do in the heat, rich, the heat rich I work for, you know, uh, you can have a very old piece of equipment, well maintained, painted, clean, but if you have a state of the art computerized system, makes all the difference, even for the customer, right? The that's foreigners exactly can, right. The foreigners can be manufacturing in 1950, if you want. But if you have all the upgrades with now with the electronic flow meters and and and, and sensors and detectors, you know it, it, they make the whole difference. So Take, taking taking that another step though, Carlos, Body Coat uh, has several plants worldwide, not a lot, but several, which are what we refer to uh, as lights out. Uh, that means that uh, the furnaces are inside a cage in the building and the work gets put into baskets and goes through the wall and a, a smart cart moves it to storage, then moves it from furnace to furnace, to wash, to temper, and back out through the wall to go through inspection. Uh, that is a hack right there, but it's a capital intensive hack. It's a maintenance intensive hack. And how do they load the, the trays? How do they manually. load the tissue? Oh, okay, Typ so that... Typically manually. Okay, with, with the lights out? No, no, no. <laughs> I know. I, 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 I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I mean, Correct. <laughs> right. So, uh, and I talked with Gord uh, and, and Peter Keller about the automation. You know, I the, the thing with our industry is that we get some uh, trays distorted. And if you want to apply robotics uh, to loading and unloading, uh, robotics uh, don't have the range to track the distorted uh, tray. So that's that makes it really difficult to... Uh, Load a, lo, load a tray or a fixture, right? Uh, put it on an automated line, uh, finish the process and then unloading it and, and go back. I mean, that's that's a real challenge with, with having a full automated line and, or, on an IQ cell. Uh, do, do, you okay, have there, there, do you have a, any reference on how can we actually uh, load automatically the fixture in back and forth? Well, if you're talking about taking the parts out of the customer's totes and putting them into a fixture or a basket, uh, that really only works if you have uh, a consistent flow of the same parts from the same customer. Mm -hmm. uh, and going back to my no more than 20% with any one customer, and within that customer, you're going to have a multitude of different part numbers. It gets very difficult. There are sophisticated robots that can handle different shapes and configurations, but those are very difficult. Coming to your point about the alloy distortion, uh, the, the way that I've seen that handled is first buy good alloy. Mm -hmm. uh, buy, buy from the best supplier that you can, the best alloy that they make. 
And second of all, use laser gauging, which can tell you if the tray is distorted out of spec. So that before it ever goes to get loaded, you know if it's distorted too much and needs some maintenance done on it. Thanks for the tip. I'll, I'll do it myself. And just to conclude, John, it's been great talking to you, getting all this knowledge. Thanks for sharing this with us. Uh, it, will there be an advice or a personal experience you would like to share for the new generation of heat traders who are watching this uh, this podcast? Uh, you have been in the heat trade basically all your life. You, you've been uh, an employee, uh, you've been an owner, you've been a big CEO. Now you have a, 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 an investment firm, right? So basically everything has uh, turned around uh, heat trade. What will be an advice to the new generation of heat traders? Well, first of all, you need to prepare yourself by getting a proper engineering education, which you've done, Carlos. Thank you. You need to be willing to work hard and learn management and accounting principles on top of that. Uh, that's really the advice. I've been very lucky in that I love heat treating, solving material engineering problems for customers, providing jobs for employees, and making a good living for my family. Thermal processing is a field that is not going to go away. So you've got job security your whole career. It'll change, but not. it's not an industry that's likely to suffer a major paradigm shift in our lifetime. Uh, just like you're doing, you can become a power player in the heat heating industry. You just have to apply yourself and of course have luck. And I define luck as where preparation meets opportunity. That's uh, the advice from maybe the most successful heat tree in the world. So uh, do follow it, audience. John, it's been great talking to you. Uh, it's, let, let's hope this is not the last time we, we can talk. You know, you're always, you know, you, uh, just, just let me know if you, you would like to do this again. Uh, super excited to learn about uh, all your wisdom and years of experience. Thank you very much. Uh, please subscribe uh, to the channel. We're on Spotify, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, the Heat Read Podcast, We posted weekly on the Monty. This is the Hitrit Podcast. See you next week.